Um, I was really excited by the idea that uh, someone was digging into the deeper history of the Adirondacks and that the deeper history of the Adirondacks included the African American experience because I think that was something that I didn't know about and that most people didn't know about. And uh, that Glenn was looking into this, uh, this history was really exciting to me. I think the perception of most of the people that live here, and certainly most of the people who visit here, is that um, the experience here after the Native Americans was really a European experience. That this is a very white area, and the vast majority of the population here is, is white people. Um, and so it was fascinating to me that the African American experience in the Adirondacks stretches so far back and that we have had uh, African Americans living here since before the Civil War and that in fact the experience, uh, the struggle of emancipation and the struggle for voters' rights, uh, the Adirondacks played an important role in that. That was really exciting to me and as an academic to know that this part of American history that our community played a part in that, that's really exciting to me. Well, I think it's actually really exciting for students to have an opportunity to learn something, not just about the world, but their specific place in the world. And I think it's a particular responsibility of inst any institution, and certainly of Paul Smith's, to look at their particular role in history. So I think it was very exciting for the students to say, oh, the Adirondacks is not just a particular isolated place where tourists come and go, uh, that we actually had a place in this, these great events of American history, the, the Civil War, uh, that John Brown, the person whose, uh, whose uh, death at Harper's Ferry was arguably the sort of flashpoint that started the Civil War, that he actually you know, started farms up here, that he brought African Americans here so that they could gain the right to vote, and that uh, you know, this region had that, that role. I think um, our students didn't really realize that. I didn't realize that. Our faculty didn't realize that. So I think that engagement was very exciting for them. Um, and I think for our science faculty, having some of their data used to actually make some of the music, I think that was pretty exciting as well. Well, so, uh, so one of our scientists, uh, Kurt Steger, uh, he studies uh, uh, paleolimnology, so that's the uh, very long time history of lakes. Uh, and so uh, he studies the lake actually right behind you there. Uh, and so uh, he had a set of data taken from the cores uh, that he takes out on the lake. And uh, that was translated into numbers. And the uh, composer, uh, Glenn McClure, took those numbers and used that to create uh, part of his musical score. So the actual uh, ecological history of our lake uh, was used to create some of the music. Oh, I think it was actually wonderful to tell this story through opera. I think the, the challenge for any uh, historical story, even an important historical story, is that it's challenging for people to connect emotionally to something that happened a long time ago. And uh, music connects with, directly with our emotions. And I think it was really wonderful that some of the libretto is actual letters that people wrote, is actual direct narrative of African Americans who lived here, and it's the words that they used. But hearing those words sung, hearing those words with music behind them, gives them an emotional impact that I think it's really impossible for them to have if you just read them on a page. So I think, uh, I think turning them into music was a really powerful and important part of the effectiveness of the message that, uh, that the folk opera creates. I think this was actually a really interesting thing to me as a you know, reasonably recent uh, person to arrive in the area. Uh, it was kind of remarkable to me the ability of the people who led this project to bring together a diversity of people uh, and the I was kind of astonished at the quality of the music community here, uh, the, the, uh, the writing of music, the musicians, the, uh, the choral performance, and it was a real community uh, event. An enormous number of people invested effort over many years to create this piece of music, to perform this piece of music, and to perform parts of it over time so it was finally possible to create a complete piece of music over time. Um, I think it was a remarkable example of how 
even in really small towns, uh, people can get together and create great pieces of music. I think it's, uh, it's a really exciting example of art coming into existence, uh, even in a small town. It's a pretty exciting thing. I think that one of the challenges in the Adirondack, both for the insiders and the outsiders, is that we have a very, um, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but there's a sort of single model of the Adirondacker that the Adirondacker, whether male or female, is uh, you know wearing boots, uh, wearing flannels, hiking, uh, fishing, hunting. Those are all fine. Those are good things, but it's much too simple. Um, the Adirond the real Adirondackers, and not that those things are false. The real Adirondackers are much more complicated people, and I think it's wonderful that the folk opera both allowed people here who were excited about music to participate in musical things, but it also shows the much more complicated history of the area, that we were an area that was involved in the civil rights movement before it was called a civil rights movement, uh, and we were uh, an area that's excited about education, that's excited about uh, music, and uh, that's excited about uh, sharing that with the world. Uh, and I mean, there's one other thing I'll quickly mention. This isn't actually connected directly with the story itself, but it's kind of an interesting side story. Um, Paul Smith's, of course, ran a hotel, which was located where we are now, roughly. And um, during the Civil War, the hotel actually did really well because uh, there were people who uh, bought their way out of having to serve in the Union Army. So um, if you were drafted, you could hire somebody else as a substitute. So during the Civil War, the word substitute meant someone who was serving time in the Union Army in place of the person who had been drafted. And this was considered kind of a shameful thing. So they would hide out. And one of the places they hid, it, hid out was actually in Paul Smith's hotel. So the hotel had great business during the Civil War with all these very health, healthy, wealthy young men who were hiding out at the hotel. <laughs> so that's another part of Civil War uh, history in this region. Uh, so not part of the folk uh, opera, but uh, part of Civil War history in this region.